we got another day of NBA action. And with FanDuel, every night is a watch party. So it's time for your FanDuel crew to make their bets. So, what's the move tonight, gang? You know that new customers who bet $5 get $200 back in bonus bets if you win. Woohoo! We're heating up, fam. Bet all the stars with all your friends and make every moment more only on FanDuel. New customers bet $5, get $200 back in bonus bets if you win. Make every moment more with FanDuel. It goes down in the field. It go down. It go down in the field. 21 plus and present in Virginia. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is non withdrawable bonus vest that expires seven days after receipt. See full terms at fanduel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Wars That Shaped the World uses dynamic, immersive audio to depict scenes of warfare. Listener discretion is advised. There is a red jacket in the grass, a private of the 34th. He is lying on his face as if he were fast asleep. His rifle, bent nearly in two by the grape shot which afterwards passed through the soldier's body, is under him, and his right hand still clutches the stock. It was the first body I saw, but as we advanced, they lay thick enough around and before him. The red coats lay sadly thick over the broken ground. William Russell, the Times war correspondent, was sympathetic to the common soldier in a manner little seen before, and certainly more so than many of the aristocratic officers who commanded them. As the siege of Sevastopol passed its sixth month, a far cry from the short, sharp shock the British and French had planned for the Crimean campaign. Hopes rose in the ranks that soon it might be over. Winter had been a dreadful experience for the British troops in particular. By its end, they were an army swaddled in any piece of clothing that might add a little warmth. Their daily sufferings faithfully recorded and reported to his readers by Russell. The arrival of spring saw those layers gradually come off, as preparations intensified for what many were sure would be the final assault on Sevastopol, the home of Russia's vital Black Sea fleet and the reason for the Allied invasion. Unfortunately for those wretched men in their ragged red coats, there was to be plenty more suffering to come. On the 9th of April, 1855, Easter Monday, the heaviest artillery bombardment the world had seen thundered from the heights around Sevastopol. 500 guns were to fire without pause for the next 10 days. Down in the port, Leo Tolstoy, then a young officer in the Russian artillery, was at his post in the 4th Bastion. It was one of the Allies' main targets. During each day of the bombardment, some 2,000 shells landed on the Bastion. The constant charm of danger, in my observation of the soldiers I'm living with, the sailors and the very methods of war are so pleasant that I don't want to leave here. Tolstoy's extraordinary diary entry captured the defiant mood among the port's defenders. It was followed by a letter to his brother, in which he wrote that he had come to even like the experience of living under fire. He confessed he'd been scared at first, but that fear had disappeared. Tolstoy and his fellow defenders dug in and hung on. Deserters may have described conditions within the port as hell on earth, but the Russians had no intention of being beaten by the Allied bombardment. The Allies knew this and knew that casualties would be horrendous. So when the barrage finished after ten days and the Russians remained unmoved and unbroken, no attack was launched. This is Wars That Shaped the World.
The French were now under the command of General Pellissier, their third commander-in-chief of the campaign, and he devised a new plan of attack. Once again, there were intensive, time-consuming preparations, and as they dragged on and the weather warmed up, disease returned to the trenches once more, spreading among the poor foot soldiers. The weather continues magnificent, but I regret to say that the cholera, if anything, has increased rather than diminished. Every day we hear of men cut off in the prime of life by this dreadful disease and almost without a moment's warning. Everything has been done that the medical men can think of to try and check the malady, but nothing seems to be of any use. The number of men catching cholera rose swiftly. Dysentery was rife. Conditions remained basic in the extreme. Russell wrote of sleeping in a hut beneath which were buried several bodies, lumps in the earth betraying their presence. D-Day for the new attack was the 6th of June, 1855. It was preceded by a two-day bombardment by the Allies' 500 guns. The start of the infantry assault was to be signalled by Pellissier and the ageing Lord Raglan, still the British commander-in-chief despite widespread dissatisfaction with his leadership, meeting on the battlefield. The agreed time arrived. Raglan and his staff rode out, but there was no sign of Pellissier. The general had overslept, and such was his temper, his aides had hesitated to wake him. He arrived an hour late. Totlaban, the Russian engineer in charge of the Sevastopol defences, was to hear of the incident later. The French army, he remarked, is an army of lions led by donkeys. It was the first recorded use of the phrase that was to become widely applied to the British army in the First World War, and might well have been applied equally to all armies in the Crimean War. The French attack went ahead without Pellissier. Sevastopol's defences were focused around a series of strong points and bastions. The French target was to take two of them, the Mamelon and then the Malakov. The Russian positions were strong and well defended. The French infantry crossed open ground under intense fire, but still reached the walls. As they scaled them, defenders hurled stones down. It was like a medieval siege. The French persisted and were able to get enough men inside to take the Mamelon and make a charge for the Malakar. The Russian fire grew in intensity, bodies piled up, thousands dead and wounded. Such a fire opened from the Malakov tower as never was seen before, I am sure. Sheets of flames with their explosions followed each other in the rapidest succession. The Russians worked their guns wonderfully well and fired like fiends on the multitudes of poor little Zouave, whose pluck had carried them to the edge of a ditch they had no means of crossing, and who stood in hesitation till they were knocked over. the French retreated to cling on to the Mamelon. When a flag of truce was raised on the 9th of June to allow both sides to collect bodies, the French had lost 7,500 dead and wounded. I rode down on a pony and then walked down the ravine. The grounds of the scene of the contest presented the same horrible appearances as the battlefields of the Alma and Inkerman. Mutilated corpses and bodies covered with ghastly wounds met the eye all around. The pale 
upturned, happy faces of some, apparently in peaceful slumber, mark the instantaneous death which they had met. The outstretched arms, as if imploring aid in others, the dreadful contortions of those who had suffered agonising deaths were to be seen in friend and foe alike. Round to the west, the British attacked another key point, the quarry pit, took them swiftly and then had to fight off waves of Russian counterattacks that continued until five in the morning. But they held on, and with the French gains, it meant the Allies were in a position to launch what they expected would be the final assault. Take the Malakov and Redan strongpoints, and Sevastopol would be theirs. The date decided on was the 18th of June, because it was the 40th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. By attacking together on such a significant date, it was supposed to show how the two former enemies had buried their differences. Soon, they were to be burying even more of their dead. The French would attack the Malakov, and when that fell, it would leave the Redan strongpoint wide open. Nevertheless, Raglan insisted the British would simultaneously attack the Redan. He did not want to face any accusations of having left the French to do the hard work. Casualties were expected to be heavy, even by the standards of the Crimean campaign. The attack would be across broken ground strewn with obstacles, the men carrying ladders to scale the walls, and all the time under heavy fire. The general staff estimated one in every two men would be killed or wounded. The French offered extra wages for anyone volunteering to go in the first wave. It was a disaster. The French first wave attacked early after confusion over the starting signal and were mown down. The second wave, seeing a sea of bodies before them, refused to go. Raglan too saw what was happening. He felt he had to support the French and ordered his men forward before the bombardment, even though he knew his decision would amount to huge losses. It was to be one of his final orders. At 5.30 a.m., the British launched their assault on the Redan. They were assailed, wrote Sir George Brown, by the most murderous fire of grape that ever was witnessed. There was around 200 metres of open ground to cover. It was carnage. The Russians mounted the parapets of the Redden and delivered volley after volley into us. They hoisted a large black flag and defied us to come on. The cry of murder could be heard on that field. For the cowardly enemy fired for hours upon our countrymen as they lay writhing in agony and blood. As some of our officers said, this will never do. We'll pay them for this yet. Barely 100 men remained of the first wave, and they sought what cover they could. When their officers ordered them to renew the attack, they refused. One British division actually broke into Sevastopol itself, but found themselves pinned down under heavy fire for 17 hellish hours before they could retreat. An officer of the 88th, Captain Brown, was standing among the staff talking to us when a round shot came and took his arm clean off. The limb flying several yards from him and nearly striking General Air, he was on the other side of the trench on his chest. An artilleryman who was with us had his head smashed by some grape shot and a sapper was killed by a round shot going through his chest. The poor fellow was literally knocked to pieces. The supposed final attack was a bloody failure. British losses were put at around a thousand dead and wounded. The French suppressed the number of their casualties, but it's estimated to be six times that. They included General Mayan, who was duly and conveniently blamed for the failure. Raglan, meanwhile, blamed Pelissier's plan. In the privacy of his own quarters, he may well have blamed himself too, for he fell into deep depression over so many British losses for nothing. He died ten days later, supposedly of cholera. Not so, said many of his staff. This was, one wrote, A case of acute mental anguish producing first great depression and subsequently a complete exhaustion of the heart's action. It is quite impossible to describe the sorrow and grief the death of our beloved chief has caused to all at the English headquarters. 
It was so awfully sudden and unexpected, even now we cannot realize it. The doctor did not anticipate any immediate danger until half past four o'clock, when a sudden change came over him. Soon after five o'clock, it was generally known at headquarters that Lord Raglan was dying, about which time he became insensible, and so continued to the last. All was over, 25 minutes before 9 p.m. Let them know, with you there is forgiveness, may they be comforted that we use loving devotion and we use redemption in abundance. May our loved one receive the comfort of knowing... So the siege went on, a cruel grinding stalemate. Despair spread through the ranks. Many a man would gladly lose an arm to get off these heights and leave this siege, wrote a British officer to his wife. Soldiers on all sides were worn down, ten months and counting. Tolstoy, ever the novelist, even suggested it should all be settled by a duel. Up on the heights, cases of what were called trench madness were documented. And the killing went on. A Russian surgeon recorded the horrors of the last stages of the siege. I do not think I ever saw such awful injuries as I was forced to deal with during the final period of the siege. The worst were the frequently occurring stomach wounds when the bloody guts of the man would be hanging out. When such unfortunates were brought to the dressing stations, they could still speak, were still conscious, and went on leaving for a few hours. In other cases, the guts and the pelvis were ripped out at the back. The men could not move their lower bodies, but they retained their consciousness until they died in a few hours' time. Without a doubt, the most terrible impression was created by those whose faces had been blown up by a shell, denying them the image of a human being. Imagine a creature whose face and head have been replaced by a bloody mass of tangled flesh and bone. There are no eyes, nose, mouth, cheeks, tongue, chin or ears to be seen. And yet this creature continues to stand up on its own feet and moves and waves its arms about forcing one to assume that it still has a consciousness. In other cases, in the place where we would see a face, all that remained were some bloody bits of dangling skin. Russian morale was plummeting as quickly as that of the Allies. Supplies were dwindling, disease spreading, they were short of ammunition and food. But still, the Tsar wanted more. He ordered one more attack. Give me a victory, and I can negotiate from a position of strength, he ordered his generals. The outcome was predictable. Another bloodbath, this time on the Fedyukin Heights. In 20 minutes, 2,000 men were cut down. The reserves met the same fate. Victims of volley after volley from the Minia rifle. By 10 a.m., it was all over, and Sevastopol's fate was sealed. A soldier wrote home. The morning of 16 of August was our last hope. By evening, it had disappeared. We began to say farewell to Sevastopol. The final nail was at last ready to be hammered into Sevastopol's coffin. The Allied trenches were now so close to the defences they could make out the faces of their enemy. The Allies were losing up to 300 men a day. This had to end, especially with the second winter now on the horizon. The assault began on the 8th of September, after a three-day bombardment. When the bombardment halted, at first, Nothing happened. At midday, the Russians, as they always did, changed guard, and many took the chance to seek out some lunch. The French, watches synchronized so there would be no mistakes, attacked at that moment, taking the Russians by surprise. Nobody attacks at noon. Again, the fighting was brutal and costly. It came down to a hand-to-hand -hand struggle, 
but the Malakov was taken swiftly. That was the signal for the British to attack. The first wave of a thousand men raced forward with ladders. Once more, deadly fire rained down on them and the bodies piled up. Some reached the walls and began to climb the ladders. Wounded and dead men kept tumbling down on us, recalled Lieutenant Griffiths. Then the British broke and fled back to their lines. Among them, Griffiths. The fire was fearful and I kept tumbling over the dead and wounded men who literally covered the ground. Officers drew swords and beat their own men to try and stem the retreat, but it was no good. The British called off the attack and licked their wounds. They'd suffered 2,610 casualties, 550 of them dead. But unknown to the Allies, the Russians had had enough. At seven that evening, they began to pull out of Sevastopol. Soldiers and the few remaining civilians gathered to cross a flimsy pontoon bridge to the northern side. Around them, their homes were on fire. Everything was to be burnt, nothing left for the hated British and French. You could smell the fear, wrote one Russian woman as she waited for her turn to cross the bridge. On the bridge there was a crash, nothing but confusion, panic, fear. The bridge almost gave way from the weight of all of us and the water came up to our knees. Suddenly someone became scared and began to shout, we are drowning. People turned around and tried to make it back to the shores. There was a struggle, with people stepping over each other. The horses became scared and began to rear. I thought we were going to die and said a prayer. At eight o'clock the next morning, the rear guard set fire to the final buildings and retreated. Tolstoy watched from the star fort on the far side. I wept when I saw the town in flames and the French flags on our bastions, he wrote to his aunt. After her crossing, a nurse paused on the far bank to look back at what she'd left. The whole city was engulfed in flames from everywhere, the sound of explosions, It was a scene of terror and chaos. Sevastopol was covered in black smoke. Our own troops were setting fire to the town. The sight brought tears to my eyes and I seldom cry and eased the burden on my heart, for which I thank God. How hard it has been to experience all this. It would have been easier to die. The siege of Sevastopol was over. The city was still burning four days later when the Allied troops entered. The French pillaged. The British drunk the city dry. In London and Paris, crowds cheered on the streets. But it was not the end of the war. Sevastopol Sevastopol is not Moscow. The Crimea is not Russia. Two years after the burning of Moscow, Our victorious troops were in Paris. We're still the same Russians. And God is with us. Still, the Tsar would not seek peace. On the far side of the Black Sea, Russian forces forced the Turks back. The British feared once more that they could threaten India. Now that the Crimean campaign was done, public opinion in Britain still favoured war. Russian power demanded Palmerston must be curbed once and for all. Palmerston's plan was to drive Russia out of Finland, gain independence for Poland, drive the Russians from Crimea and the Caucasus, and create a buffer of Western-supported states around Russia's frontiers. But France had had enough. They'd taken the brunt of the casualties because they'd done the brunt of the fighting in Crimea. Their once mighty army's ranks were now filled with raw recruits. As the British were learning their lessons, so the French were forgetting theirs. Conditions for the French still in Crimea deteriorated. There was talk of mutiny, talk of learning the lessons of 1812 and the retreat from Moscow. The French wanted out. From all the accounts who witnessed it, nothing could be worse than the state of the French army during the first quarter year of 1856. They appear to have been indifferently fed and badly clothed. Alexander, stubborn to the last, wanted to fight on, but the Austrians gave him an ultimatum, and the Tsar 
urged on by his war-weary council, at last accepted Austrian peace terms. On the 25th of February 1856, a large crowd turned up at Quai d'Orsay to watch delegates arrive for the Paris Peace Congress. Britain took a tough position. They were ready to continue war, in part because they hadn't had a major victory, nor much to show for 18 months in Crimea. Arguments raged over division of lands around the Danube and the Caucasus and Bessarabia, with Russian presence in the Black Sea and with the Ottomans over Christian rights in the Holy Land over the position of Poland. Poor Poland, remarked one British diplomat as the French dropped plans for the restoration of the kingdom. History has a habit of saying poor Poland. The political ties and webs were wrapping Europe up. The French wanted Russian support against the Austrians in their bid to push for Italian independence, which meant Poland was left to the Russians. But the Paris Treaty was signed at 1pm on Sunday the 30th of March. An hour later, the cannons of Les Invalides fired to mark the end of the war. The following day, a victory parade marched past Napoleon with crowds flocking to watch. There was an electrical tremor of excitement in the crowd and from the people there, there was a deafening cheer of pride and enthusiasm that filled the Champ de Mar better than a thousand cannon could. On the 2nd of April, the guns fired in the Crimea for the final time to mark the coming of peace. Thus ended the war, a war which, although short, will be handed down to the end of time as one of the most memorable since its beginning. Under the treaty's terms, the French and British had six months to get their battered armies out of Crimea. It was a huge task. Tons of looted booty was shipped west, including hundreds of captured cannon. Before they left, the Allies' final act was to blow up the remaining docks at Sevastopol. Mission accomplished. But at what cost? The Paris Treaty ended the old balance of power in Europe. Austria and Russia no longer policed the continent with their ruthless support for the old monarchies. That opened the door for the emergence of new nation-states, such as Italy, Romania and Germany. Austria was becoming isolated. Their failure to support either side alienated every side. But Russia was hardest hit by the Paris Treaty. Humbled, according to the historian Orlando Figues, it lost its dominant position in Europe until 1945. And of course, by then, the Romanovs were dead and buried. The Black Sea was declared neutral and closed to all warships. Russia no longer had a warm water port, nor a southern navy. It was a bitter blow, both tactically and to a nation's prestige. The Tsar's empire was in a mess. Defeat had exposed not just the inadequacies of his army, but also the entire system of government. Tolstoy was among those pushing for reform. We have no army. We have a horde of slaves cowed by discipline, ordered about by thieves and slave traders. This horde is not an army because it possesses neither any real loyalty to faith, sar and fatherland nor valor, nor military dignity. All it possesses are, on the one hand, passive patience and repressed discontent, and on the other, cruelty, servitude and corruption. With uncanny prescience, Tolstoy even suggested that so bad was the treatment of the soldiers and serfs, there was a buried feeling of revenge that would one day emerge. Oh Lord, he wrote, what horrors lie in wait for our society if that should occur? The Crimean War made the abolition of serfdom certain. In 1861, the Edict of Emancipation was signed by Alexander. It went too far for some, not far enough for others. Russia was becoming a divided country. Crimea strengthened Russian suspicion and mistrust of the West. There was a sense of betrayal. How could France and Britain side with the Ottomans against a Christian power? It sparked the rise of pan-Slavism, which found eager support in governing and literary circles. Russia supported the Serbs' push for independence. The Russians grew to believe they should control the Balkans. The Slavic peoples should be united. 
With an ailing Ottoman Empire, the Balkans became a mishmash of borders and religions and peoples. It was a powder keg, one finally set off in Sarajevo 60 years later. In Britain, there was a muted reaction to the war's end. There was no victory parade. Instead, memorials and monuments arose across the country, from city halls to village greens. 98,000 soldiers and sailors went to Crimea. Nearly 21,000 didn't come home again, 80% of them through disease and illness. The war marked the beginning of a new respect for the soldier, and a respect directed towards the private rather than the general. This was where the legend of the dependable, decent Tommy began, the lion led by donkeys. The army was reformed, and after a long struggle, the purchasing of commissions was scrapped. Men, still mostly from the upper classes, were trained and competed to become officers rather than buying their place in uniform. Britain was changing. The middle class was becoming the force, the focus of politicians. From a war that was short on heroes for the public, Florence Nightingale was held up as the example of middle-class Victorian values. Good work and hard work. Self-sacrifice for the deserving poor. Mary Seacole, on the other hand, was forgotten. In June 1857 in London's Hyde Park, Queen Victoria awarded the first ever Victoria Crosses to 62 veterans of the war. The medal was struck to mark acts of bravery by all ranks. There'd previously been no medals to recognise such courage. The small crosses were said to be made from cannons captured at Sevastopol. But in fact, the metal has since been found to come from Chinese guns. Among those first recipients was Samuel Parks, a private in the Light Brigade. Parks died seven years later and was buried in a pauper's grave. Britain has never been very good at looking after its old soldiers. It has been good at celebrating them. In the years that followed, the idea of Britain and its army of yeoman Tommies standing up for the little man took root. It was there in 1914 when the Germans marched into Belgium, and again in 1939 when Poland was attacked. In 1954, the Soviet Union marked the centenary of the Crimean War, a Tsarist war celebrated by a communist regime. Sevastopol, rebuilt and home once more to the Black Sea Fleet, had become a place of huge importance to the Russian psyche, as well as, of course, a hugely important naval base. That today's Russia would want it back should come as no surprise. The future of Crimea was determined by the a residential area with no military objects. President Zelensky today addressed an emergency session of the European Parliament. Putin's war in Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. This series featured John Brannock as William Russell, Marta de Silva as Queen Victoria, Kareem Cronfley as Lord Lucan, and Maxim Avadeyev as Leo Tolstoy. Additional voices from Zenia Leverett, Thomas Mitchells, Denis Michalet, Gennady Alesheyev, and John Walker. It was narrated by me, Paul Waggett. Wars That Shape the World is a Goal Hanger Podcasts production. It was produced by Holy Smokes. This series was written by Robin Scott Elliott. The producer was Neil Fern. The executive producer was Tony Pasta. Next on Wars That Shaped the World. The House meets this Saturday to respond to a situation of great gravity. We are here because for the first time for many years... British sovereign territory 
has been invaded by a foreign power. How brutal aggression successful in our world. If that happens, it can be a danger not merely to the Falkland Islands, but to people all over this dangerous land. The wind was pushing us against it. The anchor fell into a lifeboat. It was like squashing a snail. Nobody got out of there alive. smokes. <laughs> 